Well, greetings to everyone. I want to thank each and every one of you for, for joining, for taking part, <clears throat> be it on Zoom, be it on Facebook, be it on YouTube, or watching thereafter. I pray that we all will receive a blessing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to take this moment to praise you, take this moment to thank you, and ask, oh God, as we open your word, and as we look at history, that you would guide, that you would direct, that you would make very clear, <clears throat> oh God, to us, those things that we are seeking to understand, those things that we are seeking to see clearly. Lord God in heaven, may your spirit be upon us. May your spirit be in this presentation. May your spirit be upon the technical aspects, Heavenly Father, that these things will run smoothly as well. Lord God, we just ask for more of you in our lives, more of you in our hearts, more of you, oh God, each and every day. May every aspect of our life honor you and be pleasing to you. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. We are looking at uh, part two of lesson nine, if any man worship the beast. Let's do a little recap of what we looked at so far. The first angel tells us to worship the creator, the third angel warns us not to worship the beast. And so the big question when it comes to three angels and messages is who are you going to worship? And so we want to take a look. We want to understand as we go through these lessons, what it means to worship the beast. Uh, and to understand what it means to worship the beast, we want to identify 
uh, the beast. And many associate the beast of Revelation 13 with the Antichrist uh, that the Apostle John mentions in four of his four passages of his letters, uh, first and and second John. He has a third John as well, but Antichrist is not mentioned there. So this Antichrist uh, or this beast is identified in three different passages uh, or given details of in three different passages in Scripture. There's the little horn of Daniel 7, there's the beast of Revelation 13, and then there's this man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2. And we have seen altogether 15 identifying marks. Ten of them came to us from Daniel 7. It'll be a little kingdom. It'll, be, it'll rise up within divided Rome. It'll rise after 476 AD uh, when the last Western Roman emperor abdicated his throne, uh, the last emperor in Rome itself. It'll uproot three kingdoms. It'll be diverse or different from the other. It will have the vision and ambition of a man. It will speak great things. It will persecute God's people. It will think to change God's law or intend to change God's law. It will rule for 1260 years. That is the literal understanding from the time, times, and half of times. And when we look at the beast of Revelation 13, he has many of the same identifying characteristics. Uh, while the little horn is a little kingdom, a beast is a is identical to a kingdom or is, uh, is symbolic of a kingdom. While the little horn rises up within the divided Roman Empire, this power rises up from the sea uh, where multitudes, nations, kindreds, and, and tongues are. While the beast speaks or while the little horn speaks great and pompous things, the beast speaks great things and blasphemies. Uh, while the little horn of Daniel 7 persecutes God, God's people, so does the beast of Revelation 13. It wars against God's people. While the little horn rules for time, times, and half a times, the beast of Revelation 13 rules for 42 months, which as well is symbolic of 1260 years. But we were given some more identifying characteristics of this power. Uh, this beast of Revelation 13. It is the same as Little Horn of Daniel 7, but we're given more details. We're told that it gets its authority from the devil. We're told it's going to receive a deadly wound. We're told that this wound is going to be healed and that it will be worshipped as well. So we have 14 identifying characteristics of these identical powers, the Little Horn of Daniel 7, the beast of Revelation 13, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 speaks of a man of sin or a man of lawlessness. And when we take a look at the identifying characteristics of this passage in 2 Thessalonians 2 of this character, we see again that this is the same as the little horn of Daniel 7, the same as the beast of Revelation 13. While the Little horn, we're told, is not going to rise until after the fall of Rome. So, too, the man of sin was being withheld by the Roman Empire at the time Second Thessalonians was written. While the little horn speaks blasphemous things or boastful things, great things, the beast of Revelation 13 speaks great things and blasphemies. So, too, the man of sin claims to be God and claims to have the authority to forgive by sitting in the temple of God. The little horn of Daniel 7 uh, thinks or intends to change God's law, so too the man of sin is referred to as the lawless one. And as the beast of Revelation 13 receives its authority from the devil, so the man of sin is going to be a secret agent of the devil. Uh, and as the beast of Revelation 13 will be worshipped, the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2 will seek to be worshipped. And then 2 Thessalonians 2 gives us another, another identifying characteristic, and that is that it will follow an apostasy, a falling out, a falling away in the church. So then, who is this Antichrist that we have drawn uh, 15 identifying marks uh, of? Who is this Antichrist? Who is this little horn of Daniel 7? Who is this beast of Revelation 13? Who is this man of sin? in 2 Thessalonians 2. Well, during the Protestant Reformation, uh, this became something that uh, all who were 
uh, pursuing all who are seeking uh, to know the truth, all were in agreement on it. From the book, All Roads Lead to Rome, notice what we're told. Wycliffe, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin, Cramner, in the 17th century, Bunyan, he is the author of the classic uh, Pilgrim's Progress. The translators of the King James Bible and the men who published the Westminster and Baptist Confession of Faith, Sir Isaac Newton, John Wesley, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, and more recently Spurgeon, Bishop, J.C. Ryle, and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. These men, among countless others, all saw the office of the papacy as the Antichrist. The Reformers and their heirs were great scholars and knew the Word of God and the Holy Spirit as a living teacher. What is the papacy? The papacy is the office of the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, the head of the Roman Catholic Church. From the book, magazine Newsweek, November 1st, 1999, Martin Luther was the first to identify the papacy as such with the Antichrist. I want to stop there for a moment. That is not entirely correct. Uh, John Wycliffe, 100 years or so before him, uh, said that he believed that the Pope was the Antichrist. But anyway, at first, he, Luther, discounted the values of, value of John's apocalypse, that is the book of Revelation, but then he saw in it a revelation of the Church of Rome as a deceiving Antichrist, a view that was to become dogma for all Protestant churches. At one time, all Protestantism, all the world of Protestantism agreed that the papacy is the Antichrist. But much of Protestantism today has put aside that idea. That's another study, though. We'll get into that in a future class. So then, how do these 15 identifying characteristics apply to the papacy, apply to the Pope? I want to point out that this is not an attack on Catholics. God has many people uh, within the Roman Catholic Church. This instead is a revelation of the office of the Bishop of Rome, that the Bible has given to us a warning that within Christianity itself will arise one who will seek to subvert the gospel. As we looked at in the passages of the letters of John, we saw that the most dangerous threats are often internal. It is not the atheist that is the greatest danger to Christianity. It is not the secularist. It is not, the, uh, not those who outright attack or reject Christianity. No, it is those within Christianity who are led by the devil rather than by the spirits of God. So let's take a look at these identifying characteristics, these 15 characteristics, and see how do they apply to the papacy. To begin with, we saw that it is a little kingdom. Daniel 7 spoke of the little horn. Uh, it, is a, it is a kingdom, and is that the case for the Vatican? When we're talking about the Vatican, we are talking about the city-state, uh, where the Pope uh, is supreme ruler. I want to point out that 180 nations at this point have diplomatic relationships with the Vatican, uh, where the Pope is supreme ruler. Notice how uh, Microsoft and Carta Encyclopedia 1997 defines the Vatican. He said the Vatican City is, a, is an independent state under the absolute authority of the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. It is an enclave within Rome, Italy, with an area of 109 acres. Notice this. It is the smallest independent country in the world. Vatican City was reestablished in 1929 under the terms of the Lateran Treaty. So, does it fit this characteristic as a little kingdom? It certainly does. What about the second characteristic, arising within the ancient Roman Empire? Well, it arose within Rome itself. You can't get more central than that. It arises after 476 AD, uh, the last Roman em emperor abdicated his throne in 476 AD, and the prophecy tells us it'll rise after the fall of the fourth kingdom, after the fall of the Roman Empire. 
And this is the case. We're going to get more deeply into this. In 538 AD, there was a there was a decree issued in 533 that became effective in 538. We'll get a little bit more into this uh, decree, but no, let's notice this quote from the history of the Christian Church: Vigilius, uh, that is uh, that is one of the one of the popes, ascended the papal chair in 538 AD under the military protection of Belisarius. Uh, he was the general of Justinian, who was, fill, who was following the decree of Justinian. So Vigilius was, one of, was the bishop of Rome at that time in 538 AD, and he ascended the papal chair under the military protection of Bel Belisarius. It will uproot three kingdoms. We took a look at this when we when we uh, and a couple of weeks ago, when we took a look at the, the first part of class nine, and we saw that there were three tribes that were uprooted, that were no longer exist today, uh, that formed part of the breakup of the Roman Empire, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. These were considered tribes who, uh, barbaric tribes who uh, clung to a form of Christianity called Arianism. Uh, and the Bishop of Rome was uh, totally hostile to that. Arianism was not uh, a true form of, of Christianity, uh, but the Pope, uh, the, pap uh, the papacy, the Bishop of Rome had these three tribes destroyed. It was gonna be diverse or different from the other kingdoms, the other kingdoms that uh, came about the horns, the other horns that came about as a result of the fall of the Roman Empire. Notice uh, from the book, The Church and Churches, pages 42 and 43, we read the following. Out of the ruins of the Roman Empire, there gradually arose a new order of states whose central point was the papal see, another term for the papacy. Therefore, inevitably, resulted a position not only new, but very different from the former. Uh, what, what way is it different? All the other tribes uh, that came about as a result, all the other nations that came about as a result of the fall of the Roman Empire uh, were both uh, were, were a political or military power. But the papacy was largely a religious power, uh, as well as controlling land. Uh, you, you may hear of in history in Italy, the papal states, as well as controlling land, as well as being a political power, it was also a religious power. Uh, we are told that the little horn of Daniel 7 had the eyes of a man. And as we studied this a little more carefully, we understood that to mean it had the vision of a man or the ambition of a man. That is in contrast uh, to what its claim would be. That it is seeking, uh, ha, that it is seeking to serve God. Uh, notice from Prompted Bibliotheca, Article Two, uh, the the quote or the description of the papacy it says the Pope is crowned with a triple crown, as King of Heaven, and of Earth, and of Hell, and so the Pope was seeking to be ultimate authority not only on Earth, but also in Heaven and also from what they conceived of as a subterranean treat, retreat uh, where condemned souls are being burned today. This is in stark contrast to the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, 5 through 8, we are told, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Notice the steps that our Savior took in order to redeem our souls entirely, completely unselfish, entirely and completely selfless. One who, who went through self-abnegation in order to win you, in order to win me. He was not seeking to control. 
he was not seeking to rule. He was seeking to serve. He was seeking to save. Notice the steps that he took in order to carry out these things. He, he let go of equality with God, and he emptied himself. He became a servant. He took on our humanity. He humbled himself even to the point of death, even death on a cross, the most humiliating and the most shameful form of death in that day. So as we compare the focus of Christ with the focus of the Antichrist, notice what comes out. Jesus humbled himself. Antichrist exalts himself. He has the vision. He has the ambition of a man. This is what we are by nature. This is what the enemy of all souls instilled in our first mother, in our first parents, and this is what he seeks to instill in us. No, the, the Pope or anybody else who has not been born again uh, does not have the vision uh, of God seeking to serve. No, they have the vision of a man, the ambition of a man seeking to exalt self. Characteristic number seven, claims to be God and forgive sins. Remember the little horn spoke great things, pompous things. The beast of Revelation 13 spoke great things and blasphemies. The man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2 presents himself as sitting in the temple of God as God. Is this the case with the papacy? Does the papacy claim to be God and to forgive sins? Notice Pope Leo the 13th said the following, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Speaking of the office of the Bishop of Rome, the office of the papacy, he's saying it is the place of God Almighty. From Eucharistic meditations, uh, a, uh, something that is rehearsed, we are told, thou art a priest forever, says the ordaining bishop. He is no longer a man, a sinful child of Adam, but an altar Christus, that's Latin for another or anti-Christ, another Christ, forever a priest of the Most High with power over the Almighty. Please notice what is being said here. You have power over the Almighty, not just power of, but over. But let's take a look at that Latin term, alter Christus. Uh, the phrase antichrist that we find in First and Second John uh, comes from uh, two Greek words brought together. And that word, the first one, anti, can mean instead or because of, or in, in the room of, or a substitution for. So in other words, antichrist can mean another Christ, not just one who is openly opposed to Christ, not just one who verbally uh, speaks out against Christ, but another Christ, a substitute Christ, in a sense. One of the most popular popes uh, in, in this recent era was Pope John Paul II. He wrote a book called Crossing the Threshold of Hope. And notice what he says about the Pope. He says the Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God, one who, quote, takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. He takes the place of the Son of God. Oh my. Uh, the Catholic National Magazine, July 1895, we're told that the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. So the Pope presents himself as an altar Christus, another Christ, Christ himself. So that is clearly blasphemy, uh, as we saw in our previous lesson. But what about forgiveness of sins? I'm sure this is something many of us are, are very familiar with, uh, of, the, of a confessional. Uh, from the book Duties and Dignitaries of the Priest, uh, we're told that the priest, and that it includes the Pope, the Pope is uh, above the priest, the priest holds the place of the Savior himself, when by saying in Latin, ego te absolvo, he absolves from sin. And so it is taught 
that the priest and the Pope himself all have the authority to forgive your sins against God. But this is not what the Bible tells us. First Timothy 2, verse 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So how many mediators did Paul say exist between God and man? Only one, and that is Jesus Christ. If you have, if you have fallen short, if you have sinned, if you have departed from the way of the Lord, you can come to Jesus and you can know that he will represent you anew before the Father. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Characteristic number eight, this power, this little horn of Daniel 7, this beast of Revelation 13, this man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2 will persecute God's people. William Edward Lecky wrote the following in his book, The History of the Rise of the Spirit of Rationalism in Europe, that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent history and knowledge of history. Some estimate that over 50 million people were killed uh, under the authority of the Bishop of Rome. Identifying characteristic number nine, he thinks or intends to change God's law. Notice from the, this quote uh, from 1455, uh, Pope Nicholas V, the Pope has the power to change times and to abrogate laws and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. Oh my, it's interesting how so often in history, we find a quote that seems to come directly from the Bible. Uh, Daniel 7 verse 25 says he will think or intend to change times and laws. And here we have it right there uh, that the Pope Pope Nicholas V claimed to have that authority, that power. What has the papacy done? If you look at a catechism, you'll see that they removed the second commandment. Their argument is that it is merely a footnote of the first commandment. The fourth commandment, the commandment for the Sabbath, they changed. And the 10th commandment, they divided. Rather than making it one, they said, you shall not covet your neighbor's life. That's number nine in their catechism. And then number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's possessions. Uh, notice again from Prompta Biblioteca, Article 2, the Pope can modify divine law since his power is not of man, but of God. And he acts as vicegerent of God upon earth. So the papacy has the, has, claims that they have the authority to modify the law of God. Identifying characteristic number 10, he rules for 1260 years. You remember, may remember Daniel 7 called this a time, times, and half a times. Revelation 12 told us that this is identical at 1260 days. Revelation 13 said 42 months, and there are 30 days in a Jewish month. Uh, therefore, that is also 1260 days. So uh, does, does the papacy, does the Bishop of Rome, uh, fit this characteristic. Notice uh, that Justinian, he was, the, uh, em he was the emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, and he made a decree in 533 AD that the Bishop of Rome is the, quote, head of all bishops and the true and effective corrector of heretics. So in 533, he makes this decree, giving the Bishop of Rome headship of the church and secular authority uh, to, uh, to punish, uh, even if by execution, those who do not agree with his doctrines, with his teachings. Now, when he made this decree, uh, at that time, the tribe of the Heruli, I believe it was that tribe, was in control of Rome, uh, but they were kicked out in 538 AD, and so this this decree became effective in 538 AD. What happens 1260 years later? Notice the 1941 Encyclopedia Americana, we're told in 1798, General Berthier, general of the, uh, under the, of the Napoleon armies, 
made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. The Bishop of Rome lost his secular authority when Berthier came in in 1798. 538 AD to 1798 AD gives us 1260 years. So, so far the first 10 characteristics have all been fulfilled by the Bishop of Rome, the papacy. Let's continue, we've got five more. Number 11, he is given authority by the devil. Uh, Revelation, Book of Revelation refers to the devil as the dragon. And Revelation 13, 2 says, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Again, we're going to find that historians almost mimic word for word the phrases of the Bible from uh, from Labianca, who was, a who was a professor of history at the University of Rome, he said the following, to the succession of, C of the Caesars, that is, you know, Augustus, Justinian, Tiberius, etc., to the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his notice, his seat to the pontiff. Uh, now, the dragon of Revelation 12 worked through imperial Rome and established papal Rome as a new authority. From Stanley's History, page 40, the popes filled the place of the vacant emperors of Rome, inheriting their prestige and titles from paganism. Constantine left all to the Bishop of Rome. The papacy is but the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon its grave. So, uh, did the devil give its authority uh, to the Pope? Yes, it did, through the Imperial Roman Empire. Characteristic number 12, it receives a deadly wound. Let's go back to that event in 1798. We read the following, when in 1797, Pope Pius VI fell grievously ill, Napoleon gave orders that in the event of his death, no successor should be elected to his office, and that the papacy should be discontinued. But the Pope recovered, the peace was soon broken, Berthier, Napoleon's general, entered Rome on the 10th of February, 1798, and proclaimed a republic. The aged pontiff was hurried from prison to prison into France, broken with fatigue and sorrows. He died in August 1799 in the French fortress of Valence, aged 82 years. No wonder that half of Europe thought that Napoleon's veto would be obeyed and that with that pope, the papacy was dead. This was the deadly wound. The papacy lost its secular authority, the papacy lost uh, it, its uh, land, the Vatican as a nation, uh, and therefore it was considered to be fatal. It was considered to be dead. But the word of God claims that the wounds would be healed. When you follow the history of the papacy since 1798, you will see that little by little, more and more, the Bishop of Rome has gained more authority and more influence in the world. In my lifetime, I know John Paul II uh, was a man very much marveled at, very much influential uh, in American, uh, both North American, South American, and European uh, decisions and, and politics, Eastern European uh, as well. Thomas Gordon in 1999 wrote the following, the Vatican's interaction with the world has, in the period since World War II, been at the highest point it has ever had. Now, why does he say that? It doesn't have the, uh, the military uh, influence that it used to have, but the Pope is one who has worldwide influence now. Speaking of the deadly wound in 1929, uh, the San Francisco Chronicle uh, writes the following, the Roman question tonight was a thing of the past and the Vatican was at peace with Italy. In affixing the autographs to the memorial document, 
healing the wound. Extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. What are we talking about here? Mussolini, uh, before World War II in 1929, restored the Pope as the leader, the supreme ruler of the Vatican. He gave him the 109 acres back, uh, the independent city state. And so previously in 1798, that was taken away from the Pope. Now it has been restored. When speaking of the same event, the Los Angeles Times, uh, the headline said, Wound Healed. And again, that is uh, very similar to what uh, Revelation 13 says, his deadly wound was healed. The Pope, the papacy, according to characteristic number 14, will be worshipped. Is that the case? Well, let's uh, try to understand worship. Psalm 99, verse 5, not verse 5, King James Version. Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Why? For he is holy. God is to be worshipped because he is holy. This is echoed in Revelation 15, verse 4. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. So what reasons are we given to worship the Lord? We're told to worship him because he is holy. So worship is associated with the holiness of the object being worshipped. Now notice something else very interesting. When Elijah uh, fled from Jezebel, the prophet Elijah, uh, Israel at that time was worshipping uh, many in Israel at that time were worshiping a false, co false, false god called Baal. Uh, Elijah thought he was the only one. And notice what the Lord said to him. 1 Kings 19, verse 18. Yet have I reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not, what? Bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not, what? Kissed him. So the worship of Baal included bowing to him and kissing him. Whenever a new pope is put into office, whenever someone new is put into the office of the Bishop of Rome, uh, all cardinals come by, bow before him, and kiss him. And he receives the title, the Holy Father. The Holy Father. Again, from Prompta Biblioteca, the Pope is called most holy because he is rightly presumed to be such. Oh my, there's a lot more to worship than what we've covered here, but I wanted to give you those visible, uh, those visible and uh, more clear uh, uh, aspects of it. Let's look at one more uh, of those identifying characteristics. Number 15, he will follow an apostasy in the church. You may remember 2 Thessalonians 2. Uh, we're told that the Antichrist will not be revealed until there is a falling, unless there's a falling away first, an apostasy in the church. Did an apostasy occur before the rise of the Bishop of Rome? Uh, from Wary's Church History, page 54, we're told Christianity had now become popular, and a large proportion, perhaps a large majority, of those who embraced it only assumed the name. They were as much heathen as they were before. Error and corruption now came in upon the church like a flood. History of Civilization, Volume 5, uh, Section 1. Pagan ceremonies were established in Christian churches until Christianity exhibited so grotesque and hideous a form that its best features were lost and its early loveliness altogether destroyed. So, the early church, little by little, step by step, embraced paganism, and the Bishop of Rome, uh, when he became the most influential figure within Christianity, expedited that process. So when we look at the characteristics of the beast of Revelation 13, when we look at the characteristics of, sec of the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2, when we look at the characteristics of the little horn of Daniel 7, we find one power and one power only, one office and one office only that fits each of these identifying characteristics. And that is the Bishop of Rome, that is the Pope. So let's personalize this. 
how do we overcome the spirit of Antichrist? It is easy for us to take a look at the Bishop of Rome. It is easy for us to take a look uh, at the papacy and say, I wouldn't have gone there. I wouldn't have done that. But my friend, let's be careful. Because if we were given the same opportunities, if we were given the worldwide influence, if we were given the money that it was given, if we were given the authority that it was given, might we as well have gone down the same path? Let us be cautious because the spirit of Antichrist that we see in the history of the papacy may well overtake us as well. So then, how, what can we do to be sure that we do not follow this same path? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, after describing the man of sin, after giving us characteristics of the man of sin, Paul goes on to tell us that the coming of the lawless one, that is the man of sin, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. If we want to overcome the spirit of Antichrist, God is seeking to place in our hearts a love of the truth, and we must accept that love that he seeks to give to us. First John 4, verses 1 through 4, believe it, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of Antichrist. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So this is saying some important things. First of all, we need to test that spirit. Uh, does that spirit deny Jesus Christ? And do we trust and believe that God in us is greater than the demon that that power is actuated by? Test the spirits. Try the spirits. Does it deny Christ? And trust in the power of God to deliver you. Second John 1, verses 6 and 7. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and an antichrist. So, why do we need to love? Why do we need to walk according to his commandments? Because of the spirit of Antichrist. So then, walk in his love. Walk in his commandments. And you will rise above the spirit of Antichrist. Finally, Revelation 12, verse 11. They overcame him by two things. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. It did not love their lives to the death. We overcome the spirit of Antichrist by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb alone purges me of sin. The blood of, lamb alone, of the Lamb alone makes me acceptable before God. The blood of the Lamb shows me how valuable I am before the eyes of God. And this is so critical, critical when the spirit of Antichrist seeks to draw me away into the lures of the world. Furthermore, I overcome by the word of my testimony. As I confess to others, as I witness to others of the goodness of the Lord and what he has done for me, my faith is strengthened. My understanding of him deepens. My love for him grows and my walk with him grows closer. So how do we overcome Antichrist? Trust in the blood of Christ and confess faith in him. The history of the beast, the history of the man of sin, the history of the little horn of Daniel 7, the history of, of Antichrist says something very important to us. If we do not surrender control, we'll be obsessed with having it. If we do not give our lives over entirely to Christ, then we will be working in a way that we feel we must have it, we must have that control. My friend, 
will you choose today? Will you choose tonight? Will you choose as you watch this video uh, or as you are on Zoom right now, will you choose to trust God fully in the battle that is being waged for your soul? The spirit of Antichrist is seeking to overcome you. The spirit of Antichrist is seeking to lead you in a path where you will deny Christ and seek to exalt yourself. Will you choose to trust God? Said this will not take place within you. We're going to close at this time with a word of prayer, and I will stop the live stream. Uh, and for anybody who's on Zoom right now, I will entertain uh, any questions. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, Lord God in heaven, we just want to praise you and give you thanks that you who are in us is greater than the world, and that we have no reason to fear that when the devil comes to us seeking to lead us to a spirit of self-exaltation, seeking to lead us to a spirit where we seek to control all things, uh, we know and believe that we can trust entirely in you. Heavenly Father, when the allurements are set before us, that were set before the Bishop of Rome, that were set before the church, may we not follow that path, O God. But as Jesus humbled himself, may we humble ourselves as well. Continue to be servants of yours. Follow you, loving not our lives unto the death. This is our prayer in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, and God bless you.